The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Learn from the Leaders webinar. We are excited to have you today to highlight our grand award-winning university, Grand Valley State University. We appreciate you joining us and hope you have a fabulous webinar. My name is Sherry Solomon and I'm the Green Cleaning Program Representative at Healthy Schools Campaign, who is the organizer of this hosting webinar today. Before we get started, I just wanna share a little bit about the webinar and some of the logistics. Today's webinar will run for approximately one hour and the recording of the webinar will be available to view after today. We'll email a link to the recording and it will also be archived on the Green Clean Schools website by the end of this week. Also, at the end of the webinar, you could take a few minutes to complete a quick survey about the webinar. We would truly appreciate your feedback. Next slide. We'll save about 10 to 15 minutes at the end of the webinar for a question and answer session with our speakers. So if I can ask you if you have any questions at all throughout the webinar, please go ahead and type your questions into the question box located on the control panel to the right and click the send button. We will then take time at the end of the webinar to review the questions and answers. In addition, we will be polling you throughout the webinar. As I introduce each speaker, we will present a, po a poll. We encourage you to participate in the poll so we can learn more about our audience and what sort of focus we would like to have on the webinar and on future webinars, so please participate. I want to share a little bit about the Healthy Schools campaign and our mission before we get started and I introduce our fabulous panel. At Healthy Schools campaign, we recognize the importance of providing students and staff with the opportunity to learn and work in a place that is healthy and safe. Healthy Schools campaign is based on the simple, and common sense notion that healthy students are better learners and that health and wellness should be incorporated into every aspect of the school experience. We advocate for policies and practices that support student health and school wellness. We also build the capacity of the district, schools, and communities so that the change is meaningful and sustainable. At Healthy Schools Campaign, we recognize the importance of providing students and staff with the opportunity to learn and work in a place that is healthy and safe. We recognize that schools are built and maintained contribute to a positive setting for learning and working. We recognize that an institution's approach to cleaning says a lot about how they value students and staff, the communities they are located in, the planet and their sense of connectedness to the broader good and future generations. Green cleaning has been a core part of our program since we were founded over a decade ago. At Healthy Schools Campaign, we believe that green cleaning helps students stay healthy and learn, that it protects the health of custodial staff, increases the lifespan of facilities, preserves the environment, and ensures fiscal responsibility. Cleaning for health without harming the environment is the green way and is the system that sees continuous improvement. We have a wonderful lineup of speakers today. Our first speaker will be Ed Wierzycki, Facility Supervisor at Grand Valley State University. Ed's going to focus on his award-winning program and highlight two of the components that make his program at Grand Valley State unique. We will then be followed by Renee Hasselnick, Vice President of Sustainability, and she will share her insights on lean principles followed by Mike Sears, Nicholas Equipment Sales, who will focus on floor and cleaning. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Ed. Ed's career at Grand Valley State University began in 2009. He has been managing building services organizations since he graduated from Aquinas College in 2003 with a degree in business administration. A Northern Michigan native, now working and raising a family in West Michigan, helped shape his appreciation for being a good steward of natural resources in both his personal and professional life. Prior to Grand Valley State University, he co-owned and expanded a startup contract cleaning company 
that eventually served all of West Michigan in Traverse County and to Kalamazoo. Ed is EFT certified through the Association of Physical Plant Administrators, APA, and considers himself to still have an entrepreneurial spirit that creates a drive and spirit to seek economic and environmental conscious ways of doing business. So before we get to Ed, we see our poll. We have 33% of our school staff on the line, 7% of nonprofit advocates, and 59% other. So thank you all for joining us. And with that, I will turn it over to Ed. Thank you. First off, I'd like to be sure and thank Sherry and the Healthy Schools Campaign, as well as Renee Hesselink and Mike Steers for collaborating on today's webinar. <clears throat> Our university is grateful to be named the Grand Award winner this year, and while we certainly don't seek out recognition for the work we do, it is nice to know that as a cleaning community, we are recognizing each other for the hard work we do every day. I have spent the majority of my professional life in the building services profession and really enjoy engaging with the people that make the cleaning and upkeep of buildings happen possible. Next slide, please. The leadership of our custodial department begins with our Associate Vice President, Tim Timish, myself, Janet Albell, Raven McLennan, and Kathy Headley. As supervisors, we are tasked with overseeing the daily operations of all the functions within the custodial department the execution of event setups, work order completion, staff scheduling, personnel related matters, budget purchasing, direct management of the custodial staff, project planning, et cetera. Between the four of us, we su supervise all three shifts a day and cover seven days of the week. Next slide, please. These are the hardworking men and women who dedicate themselves to a successful cleaning operation. Approximately 106 custodians make up the custodial department. I won't read each one of their names for sake of time, but do credit them each individually for contributing to our successes. Shifts begin and end at all different hours of the day, seven days a week, to ensure we always have the ability to respond to custodial-related custodial issues on campus. Next slide, please. Martha Bravo and Darian Thor are two staff members who work in our LEED Platinum Certified Library. I always refer to this building as the shining star on campus, not only for its appearance, but also as the beacon for our green cleaning program. Next slide. Here is an exterior photo of the library built in 2014. It has approximately 150,000 square feet. Next slide. Some facts about our department. As I mentioned earlier, we have 106 custodians that maintain approximately 4 million square feet of space on campus. 1.7 million square feet is LEED certified, and these spaces definitely contribute to and drive our green cleaning measures throughout campus. We also provide setup and teardown services to the many athletic events, camps, and conferences, as well as student life events. Our department facilitates project donation, which collects all of the valuable goods left behind during move out in the spring by the students and donates them to local charities and nonprofits. Everything from household goods to non-perishable food items. A few other additional services we provide are snow removal and here in West Michigan that can get a little time consuming, trash re recycling, compost collection, light bulb changes, and small furniture moving. Next slide. Here's a photo of the main lobby at the library. Next. So GVSU has seven guiding values as board, as board of Trustees approved policy, sustainability being one of those policies. And it reads, Grand Valley State University values the guiding principles of sustainability and helping to meet the current needs of our faculty members, staff members, and students without compromising the needs and resources of future generations. We are committed to working with our community partners to create a sustainable future for our university, our community, our region, our state, our nation, and the world. We model applied sustainability best practices in our campus operations and administration 
education for sustainable development, student involvement, and community engagement by promoting social responsibility, practicing fiscal responsibility, and encouraging environmental stewardship. We provide our students with excellence in education for sustainable development by embedding theory, systems-oriented thinking, and service learning into our curricular and extracurricular program. At the time, 14 years ago, Steve Leeser and Gloria Meyer, who have since retired, were my former counterparts that led the custodial department towards being green and sustainable and aligning with the university's value. At this time, the department adopts purchasing policy to reflect these efforts and complement the LEED certified buildings being constructed on campus. There also becomes a heightened awareness to chemicals, equipment, and procedures being used in our department. At the same time, the sustainability office, which is separate from facilities, is created and becomes a pivotal partner in generating awareness, educating faculty, staff, and students, and collaborating with our department on efforts and events on campus including recycling and composting, zero waste events, zero waste events, and social awareness. In 2007, we entered the Nationwide Recycle Mania Contest for the first time and have regularly placed near the top in many categories. In 2014, we formally adopt a green housekeeping policy, and at the present, we get recognized as the grand award winner from American schools and universities. We are continuing the effort to be innovative in our own unique approach to being green and are excited about the upcoming changes and additions to our operation. Next slide, please. Some of the green cleaning initiatives that we stay committed to are participation in Recycle Mania, air quality improvements whenever possible, water minimization efforts, energy saving measures, and continuing education for ourselves and our staff. Next slide, please. These are common images surrounding our department that help promote and increase awareness of our everyday efforts. Next slide, please. Highlighting two of the components of our program, I will begin with the incorporation of our lean principles and use of the 5S methodology. If you are unfamiliar with the 5S methodology, it is a workplace organization method developed in Japan as a technique to enable just-in-time manufacturing. This idea was presented to two of our supervisors, Janet Aubill and Gloria Meyer, several years ago at a Lunch and Learn type seminar presented by Nichols. They brought back the idea to Grand Valley as a means to help improve order within our department. Renee Hesselink was pivotal in helping us launch this program, as well as many other green initiatives our school has undertaken. She provided education and training to all of our custodial staff on all of our different shifts of the, of the 5S methodology, and she regularly follows up with our leadership team and continues to make herself available as a resource to improve our green cleaning program. Next slide, please. So <clears throat> why 5S? Well, we set out to make work easier, make it more efficient to find cleaning material and equipment, keep closets clean and organized, initiate more structure, and empower our staff to take pride and ownership in their workspaces. Essentially, though, we were getting tired of seeing custodial closets that were not re representing the order that we were expecting inside of the facilities. Now, some folks within our staff already did such a fantastic job of keeping their workspaces organized and efficient. It wasn't hard to convince them that the effort to standardize all the closets throughout campus <coughs> would pay off. Next slide, please. In the initial planning phases of launching the 5S method, we recruited staff members to lead the initiation of the program. In, in the building that they were responsible for. This required taking a full inventory of all the items within the closet, determining what was no longer being used, what was trash, what could be recycled, what could be sent to our restore to have another chance at life. We even set aside funds to aid in the purchasing of organizational products like shelving, labelers, etc., requested by our staff members. We then worked with our facilities planning department to establish a standard for organizational products within each closet, which now 
exists for new buildings. Next slide, please. Some of our worst case scenarios can be seen in these pictures. Our staff's inventory reports were discovering years of accumulation and quite possibly thousands of dollars of unused equipment. I managed a private cleaning company prior to coming to Grand Valley that had to be resourceful to turn a profit, so you can imagine I was particularly bothered by these types of discoveries. So in order to reallocate these resources appropriately, we moved all the unused items back to our central warehouse and began to redistrib redistribute these supplies. Next slide, please. Here is an example of a working closet under the 5S program. Microfiber in one location, different size liners each in one location, trash carts emptied at the end of the day, and equipment appropriately stored after use. Now, this 5S method is not a perfect science. It does take all the custodians to make it run smoothly. It is sort of like that unreachable goal. It needs constant attention, regular training and reminders to staff, and regular follow-up and inspections from supervisors. But a majority of the maintenance needed to manage this methodology is pretty informal and corrections can be made quickly when needed. Next slide, please. <clears throat> when implementing our new approach to floor care, we wanted to be conscious of reducing the amount of chemical stripper we were using. We tested and experimented with Green Seal certified floor finish and stripper, but durability in our academic setting was our biggest concern with some of these products. So we shifted our attention to the orbital motion technology now found on many various types of equipment. This technology allowed us to reduce our chemical usage as well as reduce the amount of water being used. It has also complemented the decision to eliminate the use of propane burnishers. We are also hopeful that applying these principles would create a safe, safer work environment for our staff and keep our floors looking better for longer periods of time. Next slide, please. One of the more astonishing facts when we evaluate this program is the continued reduction in concentrated floor stripper being used on our campus. There is still the period periodic traditional strip and recoat that takes place. But if you look at the chart, we were purchasing nearly 500 gallons of stripper each year in 2010 and 2011. And moving ahead to 2016 and 2017, we purchased approximately 20 gallons each year. So what does that tell us? I feel one of two things. We are getting a longer lifespan out of the floor finish due to, the, due to using the surface prep pad technology with the daily scrubbing and floor maintenance, and or the combination of the two technologies, the orbital scrub and the surface prep pad, is eliminating the need entirely for stripper. I've always been a believer in not stripping good finish off of the floor, and this technology has given us the ability to do this and to produce a nicer finished product with less chances of work-related injury compared to the traditional floor care methods. Next slide, please. Some challenges and obstacles. We experienced and periodically still experience some challenges along the way, but a few that stood out in the beginning of implementing the 5S program was a major logistical challenge for us. We have approximately 70 buildings with a minimum of three to five closets in each building. So that leaves us with nearly 350 custodial closets to get on the program which led to the second obstacle. After getting our feet underneath us, we needed to provide regular oversight, especially in the beginning of the implementation stage, to ensure that this was ju just not one more idea that fades away without follow through <clears throat> from management. Creating a sense of ownership with some staff in this process was also an obstacle, but also a key to its success. We have custodial staff that have worked here for 30 years in the same building. Their closets had either become shrines to the many odd things we see in this profession or had literally bordered on the lines of hoarding. With the floor care program changes, there were definitely less obstacles and challenges to meet. <clears throat> Mainly, 
people get used to one method that works and they want to stick with what they know. Introducing technology is not always the easiest thing to do with the older, more refined generations. However, it really has proved to be an easier approach with better results and more productive. So what did that create for us? Well, everyone wanted to have the orbital technology scrubbers in their building. So it became more of a financial challenge to equip all of the necessary areas with this equipment. To combat some of this, we have been able to purchase some new equipment over the last few years, but we have also outfitted our traditional floor machines, swing machines and walk behinds with the surface prep pads and are achieving similar results. And we are also sure to schedule floor, floor projects around the availability of the equipment. Next slide, please. So analyzing the results. 5S resulted in identifying duplicating chemicals, allowing us to reduce items in our central warehouse. My personal favorite result of the program is it, in, it improved response time to custodial, excuse me, custodial emergencies on campus. As a former supervisor overseeing the evening custodial operation on a college campus, it was not uncommon to sometimes get a call to clean up blood or other body fluids, maybe a flooding shower or dishwasher, and we are able to respond quickly to these living centers directly to the custodial closets and the tools, personal protective equipment, and supplies that are needed to complete the job are there. It, made it, also, it also made it easier for staff to work in other routines covering absences or vacations because they can expect that the tools needed for the job will be present and displayed in the same manner that they are accustomed to in their own space. We also found space in closets that no one believed existed by removing the clutter and it continues to pr provide us with another tool to manage overall inventory and expenses. The floor care changes resulted most obviously in the reduced chemical usage an improvement in longevity in the appearance of the floor and higher production rates when restoring finished floors. Next slide, please. So to wrap things up, <clears throat> I strongly feel that the best way to have a successful custodial operation and a successful green cleaning operation is to try and simplify the processes, the procedures, and the chemicals. I think as managers in a higher ed environment, we sometimes think the more elaborate a program, the better it might be. I stick to the method of less is oftentimes more. Empower your staff to be the agents of the change and give them the opportunity to take ownership in your endeavors. Be innovative and aware of innovative ideas. Your staff, contractors, vendors, and organizations like APA or ISSA and your counterparts at other universities are great resources for ways to make green, green cleaning a success. And lastly, just a reminder to consider all facets. I like to think of being green as not just the chemicals and supplies, but as the whole big picture. How can we help our university and the community be more sustainable now and in the future? Thank you. Great, Ed, thank you so much. That was super valuable. And in learning more about your program, it's quickly recognizable that you have had the necessary buy-in from your administration, which is so vital. So thank you for sharing your award-winning program. We're gonna go ahead and launch the second poll. And while we do that, I will introduce our second speaker. Renee Hasselnick is founding member of the U.S. Green Building Council West Michigan chapter and the past chair of the Board of Directors and currently the chapter's Green School Advocacy Committee Chair. She has been with Nichols, which is a distributor of custodial and packaging supplies for 25 years in various positions. And 12 years ago, she became the Vice President of Sustainability. Other roles include leadership team of the Muskegon Sustain Sustainability Coalition and the Grand Rapids Community Sustainability Partnership and Chair of the TEDx Muskegon. Under Renee's leadership, Nichols achieved LEAD EBOM Z 2.0 Gold in June 2010 and recertification in 2015. 
She has documented green cleaning programs for many lead projects in Michigan, probably more than 100. She is lead AP, B, B, and C, and also recently obtained her SIMS Cleaning Industry Management System Certification Expert and certified as a trainer for the Cleaning Industry Training Standards. And before we move on to Renee, our poll, do you use any of the lean principles in your green cleaning program? And 43% yes, 57% no. So hopefully Ed's introduction of lean principles and Renee's uh, further explanation will um, encourage more folks to use our lean principles. And with that, I will bring Renee in. Thanks, Sherry, and I'm excited to see that 43% do. That's awesome. So, so I'm going to dig into lean principles, and hopefully by the time my presentation is done, you will see how that just goes hand in hand with being a sustainable organization and sustainable department as well. Um, as Ed mentioned, the 5S program, um, that is really the foundation of lean and it's all about reducing waste. So next slide, please. So what is lean? Um, you know, lean is really about using less of everything. And many times, you know, tying this into sustainability, many times when you're in the sustainability world, you think about solid waste only. So um, in a few slides, I will talk about the different categories of waste, but there are several. And it's really about using less of everything. Um, it gives you a set of, you know, a set of principles, a language to follow if you're implementing lean. Um, it is a commitment, as Ed mentioned. Um, it's not easy. It's a journey. It, it takes follow up, you know, following up on things and making sure things are happening. Um, and we'll talk more about that. So next slide, please. So the logic of lean is really getting to the source of the waste and to the root cause. So um, it's about creating, you know, looking at uh, what creates value in your organization and what creates value for the customers that you serve. And we all are serving customers. So think about that, who your customers are. Um, it is very much about people not just the tools that we use. So it's about behaviors and attitudes, um, respect and getting buy-in to make it all work. Um, ultimately, what, you know, what needs to happen is, is it needs to become part of your culture. Next slide, please. So what, why is Lean so special? Um, it's been around a long time. As Ed mentioned, the initial concept was developed in Japan, and it was brought to the United States um, back in the 1970s by the automotive industry. But we now see it widely being adopted by, you know, education, healthcare, and most, most industries are talking about lean principles now. Uh, it makes sense. Anytime we can reduce waste or identify waste, we can reduce it. Um, it's about redesigning processes and procedures that create less waste and really ultimately about improving efficiencies. It doesn't have to be costly, um, meaning that, you know, that makes it accessible to everyone. Um, and it, you know, it, it should be inclusive of everyone. Many times we see, you know, organizations implementing lead and or lean and, you know, people get left out because they may be, especially in a manufacturing facility when, you know, maybe the custodial team or other departments that are not specifically related to manufacturing get left out of the process. So it should be inclusive of everyone, everyone matters. Next slide, please. So learning never ends. Um, I think we've mentioned that lean is a continuous improvement process. Um, you know, the components of the continuous improvement process, and I've, I've got a, a acronym PDCA, which is the cycle of lean or the lean working structure. And I'll just run through that, what that PDCA means. So what, you know, your first step is you're going to plan, you know, create a change or create a plan for change. 
identifying specifically what you want to change, define the steps you need to take to make that change, and then kind of predict the results of the change. Uh, the second, the D is carrying out the plan in a trial or a small environment um, on a small scale under controlled conditions. Thirdly is check. You want to study in the, um, the results of your trial. Verify that if you have improved the process, consider implementing it on a broader scale. And if you haven't improved that process, go back and try it again. And then finally, act. You want to implement the changes you verified on a broader scale and update your standard operating procedures. So that's the, um, the cycle of lean or the lean working structure. Next slide, please. So I mentioned earlier the different categories of waste, and in most um, lean documents, you're going to find at least these seven types of waste, and I'm going to add one more to it to make it eight. But the seven that you typically see listed are overproduction, defect, delay or waiting, processing, motion, transportation, inventory, and then the eighth one that I'm going to throw in there is underutilizing your people. So I picked out, next slide please. I picked out just a few examples um, to demonstrate, you know, what, what could be a, a waste in several different categories. So if you look at this photo, um, I actually took this photo. And so the, here I'm gonna be talking about a waste of motion and the example that I show here is, you know, it looks like uh, a lot of things that might be used on a regular basis are being stored on a bottom shelf of a shelving unit. Um, not very convenient to find what you're looking for, having to bend down and sort through some things to find what you actually need. So, um, you know, a lot of time is wasted for whoever has to access the materials on this shelf. So a, a better solution would be to have things that you use regularly at a, you know, a middle shelf so that they're easily accessed. Next slide, please. Another example, um, excess inventory. And I would say this is probably pretty common in most of our custodial operations. We're afraid to run out of anything. So many times we see closets that are filled to the brim with inventory, um, you know, and really you should be stocking enough inventory to get you by until, you know, the next time you place an order. If you're ordering every two weeks, you should never have more than two weeks worth of inventory, maybe a little bit more for safety stock. But, um, you know, we see a lot of this and, um, the picture that I have here is probably, an, I hope, an extreme example of what you might find on someone's desk. Um, but you know, can't possibly find things when you have a lot of clutter and stop hoarding. <laughs> as, and as you even mentioned that they found some of those situations. So next slide, please. I couldn't resist leaving this photo in. And I, you know, this isn't a custodial closet, but I left it in because in many of the presentations, in fact, almost every presentation I've given and shown this um, slide because, you know, we're responsible for going in and cleaning this area. Um, most custodian teams that I have talked to and shown this picture to, um, they have it in real life. It is, it is a real life example. So um, I wanted to leave that in there. So next slide, please. Uh, another example is waste of transportation. Um, that's where we're moving a lot of things around, whether it be people, materials, um, you know, maybe some of you still have that person who is designated as running around picking up supplies because we can't plan well enough. Uh, so they may be running to suppliers to, you know, pick up floor, floor care products or whatever it might be. Um, we don't see this happening as much because I do believe that we realize that that is a waste of time, which is money. Um, but some of us may still do, you know, run around and pick things up. So next slide. 
Um, this is the eighth underutilizing people. This is the eighth waste that I added on to our list. And, um, you know, we talk in lean, we talk about respecting people and including people and getting them to buy into the program. And I think this is a very important aspect of it. You know, we, maybe we don't know our people well enough to recognize the skills that they have, or maybe we don't give them a chance to, um, you know, express ideas and, and opinions on how things might be better. Um, so I think that's very important. And it's, and, you know, it's a way to engage people in the process. Next slide, please. Um, another example, defects. Um, you know, we're wasting time when we have to rework or fix things that didn't go right the first time. And maybe that is because we don't have documented procedures or we haven't done a good enough job training people. Um, but, or maybe we aren't a good delegator and we just fix things instead of, you know, bringing it to someone's attention who maybe didn't do it right the first time. But, you know, anytime we can take the time to put a good training program, either a, a pro program, you know, for new people coming into the department or an ongoing training program to make sure that people are trained well and know what to expect. Um, you know, it's gonna help things all, all along. So now let's, next slide. Now let's dig into what, you know, what to do. What, how do you implement a 5S program? And the five S's stand for sort and separate, scrub and shine, select and straighten, then standardize, sustain, and then I also add, um, you can add it as a sixth, you know, pillar of that is to make sure you're keeping safety in mind at all times. So next slide, please. So the first thing we need to do if you want to start implementing this program is really to sort out and separate. Um, like Ed mentioned, they started sorting their closets and deciding, you know, what things were going to be used, but just maybe not, you know, often, what things they use often, and then what things could they dispose of either by recycling or repurposing to, you know, another department or another building. So if possible, it, you know, it's easier if you can remove everything from the closet um, and then start a, a system of, you know, deciding, you know, what to do with it. So, um, you know, you can do that formally by using a reg tag system and then taking all those things with a red tag and putting them in a central location um, and eventually disposing or repurposing. Um, but it just, you know, gives you a formal way to sort things. Um, you may need to find alternative storage locations if you decide that you need to keep some of the things that you're sorting. So that, that's kind of the first step. Next slide, please. So then we wanna, you know, once we have everything out of there, we want to make sure that we're treating our custodial areas as, as well as we do other areas of the building that we clean every day. So let's initially get that, you know, area cleaned really well. Um, you know, we may need to elevate our standard of cleanliness for our custodial closets. Um, but we want to eliminate the sources of, you know, dirt, contamination. Um, also taking into consideration how we're maintaining our tools and equipment when we put them back. And then ultimately, and I'll talk about this in a couple of slides, is build a visual standard, you know, that becomes routine and integrated into our daily work. So next slide. So we're sweeping, wiping, picking up, keeping things in order. Um, mentioned that it should become part of the daily routine. You know, cleanliness of our closets is, is closely related to the attitude that our staff has. Um, and we want to enhance the quality and pride. And it really, when we're keeping our custodial areas clean, it um, really demonstrates professionalism as well. So next slide, please. Please do not let your tools and your equipment look like this. Um, you know, I talked about the importance of keeping 
things clean. This, this is an example that we actually took a photo of. So please, um, you know, make sure that people know how to do simple maintenance when they're putting their equipment away and know how to change filters and, um, you know, just, 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 we think it's common sense, but it isn't always. So next slide, please. Another example of what we don't want to happen. Um, you can see the corrosion all, uh, you know, down on the floor in that photo as well. So, and that could be a safety hazard as well. If we don't, you know, if those chemicals don't interact well together, that um, wouldn't be a good thing. So, next slide. So next, once we have everything sorted out, we have the area clean, now we start putting it back together. Um, hopefully you have space for enough shelves in your closets, and I know that's not always the case, but the ideal situation is to really put it back thinking of ergonomics as you're setting home locations for each of the products. Um, you know, you want to have the shelves labeled. Um, not even the things that, you know, even the things that go on the floor, like your janitorial cart or your mop bucket and ringer, have a, a space outlined with tape on the floor that, you know, is a designated area for those items to go back to. Um, you know, I mentioned keeping ergonomics, don't put heavy things on top shelves, have the things that you are used most often at an easy to grab location. Um, you know, color coding is a great way to make things happen. Um, I've got an example of a 5S board because sometimes pictures say a thousand words. And then personal items should have a home too, which is separate from work items. So next slide. Here is a sample of a 5S board that you could use and it could be just a bulletin board could be a whiteboard, but somewhere that show can show what that closet should look like. Um, and I'll talk about auditing in a moment, but it might have the procedures pinned up there. Um, you know, just a place to gather ideas from the staff. So just, just you know, make it your own. Next slide, please. So once we have that all figured out, um, you know, and I know this isn't always possible, but it would be great if you could standardize as much as possible across all closets and all buildings. Um, this helps with, you know, having to substitute, um, you know, someone from one team has to go to another building and substitute. It cuts down on time wasted if they know exactly where to find the products in that closet that they're substituting in or that area of the building. So um, therefore, you know, that standardization becomes very important and it will help cut down on wasted time. So next slide. And then sustaining, you know, how do you sustain this? And auditing is a great way to do that. Um, it could be, you know, it could be a little bit fun if you had custodians auditing each other. Um, I've seen that happen. and. It just, you know, you got to be careful with that, but it, it does um, create a little fun if you have the right situation. But, you know, you can do that. I believe Ed said that they do it with supervisor um, audits, which is a great way to do it, too. Um, and you can do it just really informally by management walk arounds and just, you know, going around checking and then pointing things out or, you know, just just be careful, you know, have to be careful when you do that. You don't want to, you know, because especially if it's a shared space, um, you know, you just got to be careful about how you're handling that. Next slide, please. And then here's just a very simple um, example of an audit that you could use. Next slide, please. And so, you know, I, I borrowed one of Ed's photos because, um, you know, this is the ultimate, you, what you want it to ultimately look like, very organized, things in its place, um, equipment looks like it's been maintained and cleaned before putting away. 
So just wanted to congratulate Grand Valley on um, being recognized for this, you know, their green cleaning program. They've done a great job. And that's all I have. Great. Thank you so much, Renee. Uh, really great presentation and truly appreciate how you provided concrete examples, um, highlighting how small changes can have significant impacts on time and thereby cost. So thank you for that. Before I introduce Mike, we're going to go ahead and launch our final poll. You would not mind participating. And with that, I'll introduce Mike. Mike Sears has more than 35 years of experience in the equipment sales and service of janitorial and packaging equipment. He has been working uh, with the majority of well-recognized brands. Specifically in the past 10 years or so, Mike has spent a great deal of time helping to educate customers on newer technologies that reduce the use of chemicals and labor. And we'll go ahead and find out the results of our poll. Are you using chemical strippers on the floors at your educational facilities? 18% yes regularly, 50% yes, but less than we have in the past, 23% as little as possible, and only 9% never. So that's great news. And with that, I'll turn it over to Mike. Thank you, Sherry. Um, orbital technology, next slide, please. Um, just want to talk a little bit about what orbital technology is, in case you don't know. Um, traditionally, um, most people, if they're in the cleaning industry, will have a disc or a rotary brush, either floor machine or auto scrubber. Um, and those are moving in a circular motion. It's a round pad, it agitates the solution, and then with an auto scrubber, it's picked up. Traditionally, we're looking at that 175 to 350 RPM speed. Um, with the introduction of orbital, we went from that round or rotating to that orbital or oscillating technology that moved in a much faster fashion. So it rotates at 2250 RPM usually. Next slide, please. So <laughs> probably, uh, the orbital technology has been around for about 40 years, um, and traditionally it was used in the wood floor industry. Um, we didn't really see this technology anywhere else except in that arena, um, and traditionally it was used on wood floors and homes and schools and things like that, but uh, other than that, we didn't really see it um, in the marketplace. So next slide, please. So 10 plus years ago, a manufacturer decided to put orbital technology onto an auto scrubber. And um, obviously, uh, they were thinking, hey, can we, can we uh, prep a gym floor a lot quicker than, um, than we did before with the old orbital cord electric machine? Um, so they went through that process, and they were utilizing it, and they had the uh, surface prep pad, as you see shown, um, and one of their engineers happened to drive out onto a uh, BCT floor or a finished floor, and thus we see what has happened. Um, thus broke through, and that orbital technology has just gone crazy in that sense. And in the right picture, you see somebody that's using a surface prep pad to uh, prep a floor for recoding. So what are some of those advantages? Next slide, please. So the big thing we see for orbital auto scrubbers is they are doing finish removal, whether it's on BCT or a stone floor or anything else. Um, that is the number one use. We see it for project machines. Um, although it has many other uses, um, that's where we see it today. Um, normally, the machine's able to remove, uh, depending on the finish and all those types of things, it's able to remove one to three coats of finish. What we always like to say is it removes the ugly layers off the floor, so then you can recoat it and have a nice and shiny floor. And then with the automatic scrubber, with a 20-inch machine, we see that you can prep or uh, remove 
that finish a thousand square feet in 15 to 20 minutes, depending on what your what machine you're using and how fast you're going. Um, another huge thing that we found out: some people will use a little bit of chemical in there, but most of the time we're finding, and especially in GBSU's case, we were able to use just water, and that's a great carrier, and we're able to just in one pass do that prep the floor and it's ready for finish. Next slide, please. So some of the other advantages um, when we started going out with this machine, and especially in GBS use case, um, the labor savings. Um, compared to conventionally floor stripping with uh, chemicals and machines and all that, we found a 50 plus percent uh, labor savings. Um, and then with this technology, they actually put out less water on the orbital system, so we're able to see less chemicals being used and less water overall. Um, this also goes to play uh, rotary disc compared to orbital. We're able to use um, the floor pads don't wear out as quick, so we're able to clean those and utilize them um, again and again. Um, the auto scrubber version with batteries and things like that, we're able to use smaller motors on the orbital machines than we are on the rotary machines, thus we're getting longer run times with smaller battery packs. And then the other big one is, hey, you're able to get right next to the edge, get into corners, all those types of things. Um, next slide, please. So just some uh, various platforms. The one on the top left-hand side, is a um, four by 10 inch orbital uh, floor machine that is a cord electric, you plug it into the wall. So that's something that uh, has come out in the past five or six years, and that's really replaced what we call a doodle bug um, in, the, uh, <clears throat> in the industry. So it takes a lot of the, the labor out of it for somebody having to do um, finish removal or any kind of cleaning in a small congested area. Uh, the one down left side at the bottom is a cord electric uh, traditional 14 by 20 uh, orbital machine, which that pretty much if you're buying a cord electric one, um, you're usually going to buy that in a 14 by 20. It also is made in a 14 by 28. Um, Top one in the middle is an automatic scrubber, 14 by 20 with batteries and all that. That's pretty traditional size. The one uh, middle on the bottom is a 28 inch, so 14 by 28. And then the one on the far right is a sit down rider that you can actually use. And that's a 28 inch model also. So a um, couple other things, next slide please. Some of the other uses that we have found for orbital technology, um, whether it's a cord electric or an auto scrubber, the picture on the left that you see, um, we have what's called a turf pad or a turf brush, um, and we're able to clean textured surfaces, grouted tiles, things like that. So, so many uses, very little um, effort on the part of the operator. Um, and it just does a fabulous job, and this is an extreme situation, but you see how clean that is. Um, so that's one, one use for the orbital technology. Then on the right side, we have the traditional uh, pad and maroon pad, but we're also finding a lot of people that are utilizing this for diamond polishing their floors also. So if they have a stone floor or terrazzo or something like that. Uh, next slide, please. And then, Still, we go back to the traditional um, sanding wood floors, still widely used in that uh, arena, um, and that's going to be with sanding screens and then that maroon pad again. On the right side at the top is a microfiber pad, and actually we have quite a few customers that use their orbital to um, do some interim cleaning on their carpet. And then at the bottom is actually a orbital machine with an, a, what we call an abrader plate, and they're actually, if you have mastic or something like that on a concrete floor that you need to get off, 
that uh, 2,250 RPM along with the weight really takes that stuff off very quickly. So um, just that's pretty much the wide variety of uses and things that we can do with that. So on that, I say thank you and enjoy the rest of your day. Great. Thank you so much, Mike. That was a great presentation and a lot of really interesting points. A 40 to 70 percent water reduction alone is just a great added value for uh, that technology. So we do have a few minutes to answer a few questions that have been posed. Uh, let's go ahead and start a couple questions for Ed. Ed, with your floor program, how often do you believe you will need to use chemical stripper on the floor going forward? Um, it's a good question. I think we're still in the process of trying to figure that out, but I think, I, mean, I think each one of us as supervisors or our history kind of dictates when it's due. And I think what I'm trying to accomplish is not, not to jump the gun too soon and just let the technology and the, and the pads go out as long as we can. So, really answer that question but I'm thinking where we might have seen two to three years we're already kind of pushing the envelope at four or five maybe even six years at this point so we're I think we're doubling it at, at the minimum great okay next question is for it could be for Ed and also for Mike how do the custodial staff handle the vibration of the orbital equipment Mike, you want to take that, or do you? Sure, I'll take that. Okay. Um, really, um, the vibration is greatly reduced. Um, they do have uh, dampering um, devices on there that actually take that vibration right out. Um, especially nowadays, in uh, 2018, a number of machines have come out where you very, you put your hands on it, and there is very little vibration, if any. Um, and on the automatic scrubbers, we've really not seen a whole lot of vibration, but definitely the longevity of the machines um, nowadays, um, we're actually seeing less maintenance uh, than we ever have. Uh, some of the, a lot of the vendors are putting, you know, large warranties, a three to five year warranty on that, on the orbital head itself. So um, it really is the, just as easy as running a regular auto scrubber or floor machine. So. Yeah, I want to add one thing too. So with the vibration, I think I haven't seen much of any concern with the vibration. And the one thing I've noticed is we can take a new a new staff member with little or no experience and put them on a on an orbital orbital machine as opposed to like an old rotary swing machine and they can almost use it you know within minutes as opposed to maybe the training used to take hours in that case to get them to feel okay with it yeah the safety factor on the orbital cord electrics is definitely there and you're 100 percent right great okay well i know we are low on time so i'm going to finish up with one final question if there are other questions posed i will go ahead and um uh, bring those to the panel's attention and we will get back to you. Uh, this is for Ed. Ed, congratulations on your award. It appears that you have a supervisor to custodian ratio of 1 to 25. That said, what are some of the challenges that your supervisors face to ensure that your green cleaning program, your green, I'm sorry, your green cleaning methods are consistent among your staff? Um, that's a good question. I mean, it's it's a daily challenge. I mean, we're I don't want to say we're spread out thin in the oversight category, but I mean, I think that's where with, with the approach that we take here is, you know, it's not my program, it's our program. So our staff, I think, help us achieve those successes. So and, and really, it's dependent on on that on that effort. Great, I think that's a great way to end the webinar. I wanna thank you all for attending and thank you to our fabulous presenters for sharing their expertise. Also a special thanks to our sponsors listed here 
And just as a reminder, a recording of this webinar will be available on our website and email to all attendees. And with that, we will close out. Thank you all for attending and have a great day.